Even though a car is just a lot of metal and other parts combined, it's hard to imagine our world without cars. Today, I'll show you how the automobile cult in the United States was born, who made it possible, and what exactly changed the course of American automotive history. On August 5th, 1899, the young, talented mechanic Henry Ford, who impressed investors with the first movable by engine object with wheels, received funding and the right to manage Detroit Automobile Company, the first American car firm. By 1903, Henry Ford developed his first real cars used for delivery, which were so heavy, slow, uncomfortable, and extremely difficult to assemble that in four years, he only managed to make 12 of them. All the money was spent. Investors didn't like the outcome, and Henry was fired. But he was keen on making a quality car quickly and didn't stop there. He founded Ford Motor Company in the same year and continued his mechanic experiments until he opened Ford Piquette Factory in 1904, the first full-fledged plant in Detroit. Henry Ford is the first key person on our list. In the same year, 1904, an investor, William Durant, purchased a small no-named company named Buick that he brought to industry leaders by 1908. Using his outstanding entrepreneurial skills, Interestingly, Henry Ford also came up with his own first car, the Ford Model T in 1908. What set the two businessmen apart was that Ford discovered the beauty of the conveyor, which allowed them to drastically speed up the production process as this method suggested producing the same product using the same parts on one moving line, optimizing time consumption and workforce. While Durant basically created a business model that relies on different models in his brand strategy, trying to put consumers into different segments with their individual needs, and they were both successful. As an entrepreneur with high goals, William Durant decided to open a managing company that would handle all the factories he owned by 1908. The name of the company was General Motors. Seeing profits from Buick Company, Durant started to buy car-related companies one after another to eliminate competition. Oldsmobile, Cadillac, Oakland, or Pontiac, and Rapid Motor Vehicle, or GMC. He would have purchased Ford Motor Company too, he just couldn't afford it. It's worth mentioning that he was also using investors' money to buy companies, and not everyone liked this approach, to the point that in 1910, he was dismissed from his own company. But artful investor Durant managed to open the Chevrolet Company in 1911 to be Ford's competitor making cheap cars for the general public. He started taking away part of the market from Ford, slowly making money that he later used, partly with investors' money again, to providently buy back his share in General Motors until he came back on stage. Then he continued buying companies again. Unfortunately, Durant couldn't predict the Great Economic Depression in the 1920s, and due to his aggressive buying strategy, he was exiled by his investors a second time. But we all know that General Motors Company still exists today. William Durant is the second key person on our list. Meanwhile, another individual affecting our story was Walter Chrysler a well-educated top manager of a locomotive company whose management talent was noticed by one of the board directors of this firm, Mr. James J. Storo, who also was a shareholder in Buick Company. Basically, he advised to the president of Buick, Charles Nash, to headhunt Walter Chrysler to reorganize the manufacturing line at the Buick's factory, and he was not wrong about his decision. As Chrysler increased production from 20 cars a day to 550 in a matter of four years. Although with the Great Economic Depression difficulties came into play, business approaches of Durant and Chrysler were so different from each other that even highly skilled managers such as Walter Chrysler was fired from Buick in 1920. The good thing about this cooperation, though, was that Chrysler was able to gain more skills, now in the automotive field, that, you guessed it right, he founded his own company called Chrysler. It's worth mentioning that at this point his fellow competitors were serious industrialists, and without the necessary funding, he couldn't start a proper enterprise. But again, Walter Chrysler was noticed by the people from Willys Overland, a highly funded company that was struggling without a good manager. They knew so much about his achievements and were so motivated to hire him that he received a two-year contract with a total payout of $2 million during this term, and it's not in today's money. 
Successful manager Chrysler saved the company and moved his interest towards Maxwell Motors Company in 1922, which was also struggling due to unusual marketing, positioning a woman at the center of the brand. Sorry women, but at that time, people didn't care or want a woman representing an automotive company. It was a rather bizarre tactic which apparently management of Maxwell Motors didn't understand, or let's say they were way too progressive for their time. Women didn't have money at that time, and men simply didn't want to buy a car designed for a woman. That's where all the struggle was coming from. Our intelligent manager, Walter Chrysler, started to quickly change everything. However, this time it didn't go as well, as the company was too large to implement changes quickly, and it was in the middle of the Great Depression after all. It took Chrysler three years to sort things out before the company ceased to exist. Walter, though, who already had a decent amount of money to invest with the use of Maxwell leftovers from existing facilities, officially launched Chrysler Motor Company. He took off very quickly and soon after launched two other brands, Pontiac in 1926 and DeSoto in 1928. And just like our old friend William Durant, who is obsessed with buying other automotive companies, Walter Chrysler got a hold of Dodge Company because two Dodge brothers passed away due to pneumonia and no one from the family knew how to handle the business. How convenient. This is how Walter Chrysler became the third key person in the Detroit automotive world. By the 1930s, Detroit had become a prosperous industrial city since it contained not just car manufacturing companies, but all the supplying businesses within the automotive field in the same area. This accelerated the further urbanistic development even faster, while most of the population was employed and completely relied on the automotive sector of the economy. However, there were certain complications in the big growing city. The stock market crash of 1929 and the financial crisis forced big automotive companies to cut their spending and fire a lot of people. Therefore, there were many not quite peaceful demonstrations which were aggressively put down by authorities, with a bunch of victims and deaths from both sides. It all looked like the end of the prosperous industrial world. The factory workers requested to bring people back to work, raise the wages, and stop racial discrimination. But the most interesting request besides all these was to form workers' unions, something that was never a thing before, although this requirement was not met at first. Ruther Brothers and United Auto Workers, UAW. Walter Ruther got a job at Ford's factory in 1927 and quickly started climbing the career ladder. He was even sent to the USSR to help it launch the assembly line of the Ford Model T in 1929, when Henry Ford sold it to the Soviets. Walter saw a huge difference between how Ford treated his workers and how they were treated in the USSR. Ford's place was heaven compared to hardcore conditions in the USSR. Meanwhile, his brother Roy Ruther was at the origins of the workers' union creation during the financial crisis of 1929. He absolutely hated employers' domination on the industrial market and was thinking about how to gain influence over the big manufacturers. These two brothers were the key people embodying the opposite side from all the previous industrialists. It's worth stating that both Ruther brothers were committed socialists and they created United Auto Workers, a labor union that represented workers in the United States. In 1936, they convinced workers of the Kelsey Hayes factory that was making supplies for Ford vehicles to go on strike because of Henry Ford's idea to speed up the conveyor. The UAW union became a middleman between workers and employers' negotiations. To satisfy workers, management had to agree to certain union conditions. Once the Ruther brothers realized that this scheme worked, they organized the sit-down strike at GM's factory in Flint on December 31, 1936, where workers were just sitting on the floor doing nothing. Factory management simply decided to cut all the power and heating in the building to let workers think about their behavior. The news about this incident spread so quickly around the area, thanks to the Ruther brothers, of course, that it became a chain reaction. Factories all over the country went on strikes. Authorities tried to settle down the protest by incorporating active methods, after which you usually go to the hospital. But workers stood strong. The GM workers' strike in Flint lasted 44 days, 
Management gave up only after the Chevrolet engine factory workers went on strike as well, as Chevy was GM's most profitable brand at that time and it just couldn't afford to stop its production. General Motors finally agreed to all union's conditions and signed Ruther's Treaty of Detroit, a document that gave the union a seat on the board of directors of the company in return for not going on strikes for five years. In 1937, just four weeks from this moment, 60,000 workers of the Chrysler factory went on strike too. And yes, Chrysler signed the same paper as GM, giving rights to this union. The Ruther brothers were basically taking away positions in the management of the whole concerns of the company. Why did big automotive companies give the union such leverage in all decisions they make? Unfortunately, it was the conveyor. Due to the concept of this production method, it relies on many parts from other conveyors and other factories. And if the main conveyor line stops, all other supply lines must stop too, because the warehouse space is limited. It makes no point to supply parts when the main product is not being assembled with these parts and therefore cannot be completed. Ford was the last standing company with no strikes because Henry Ford had the best wages and overall conditions for his workers. It made no sense for workers to go on strike. They liked Ford. He was really strict about Union's idea and didn't allow this nonsense at his factories. So the Ruther brothers came up with a plan. They invited journalists and started handing out flyers near Ford's biggest factory. Nothing was happening, so several Union people decided to get inside the factory to cause a fight between them and the factory's security that was later publicly announced everywhere on the media, showing Ford as a disgusting tyrant. Henry Ford was strong enough to withstand four years of constant mass media lies that were disgracing his brand and making him lose money. In 1941, he finally gave up and came to an agreement with the UAW Union. Ruther brothers turned their union into a powerful political tool to lobby their own interests. They didn't really care about the exploited workers. All they wanted was the power and political influence to control big companies while looking into their deep pockets. Because the factory workers had 30-hour work weeks compared to an average of 40 hours and were getting twice as much as the normal wage, and that was before the union's existence. After all, it was all a big money game for all these people on our list. If you pause car production, your customer will buy from another brand that has cars in stock, so you'd better obey the union's policies to keep making cars. By 1935, the U.S. economy finally straightened out and recovered from the Depression. Detroit became the center of migration between 1935 and the 1950s, and the fourth largest city in the U.S. by population. When the world entered the Second World War, the most fighting took place on the territory of the USSR, Europe, and Japan, leaving the United States in the supplier's division. Therefore, most of the Detroit factories were refocused from cars to the production of military equipment, hardware, and other army supplies. The U.S. economy started booming. Henry Ford's conveyor mastery allowed him to assemble an entire 25-ton heavy bomber plane from a pile of parts on the floor to a ready-to-fly aircraft in just one hour. Chrysler factory alone built 90,000 combat units during World War II. In comparison, the USSR made only 95,000 units in the whole country. After the war ended, the United States troops also brought a lot of valuable industrial equipment from the defeated countries, a typical procedure for winners in the wars. By the 1950s, the United States returned Detroit back to normal, civilized, focused life, entering the golden industrial age of its automotive history. The economy was growing, car brands were launching new models one after another, and people had money to buy all of them. The entire American lifestyle started to form around automobiles. The freeway network was growing rapidly, and enthusiasts, families, young and old, everyone got to enjoy their cars while driving down the road to anywhere they wanted to. The first American car clubs also appeared in the 1950s, and everything was great. Everyone was happy. But unexpectedly, several factors, totally independent from each other, somehow came into play at the same time. In the 1960s, there was a new mass culture among young people who had public values and interests opposite from the general public. These people were looking to reach enlightenment, nirvana, and didn't want to own a personal car 
they valued living in the communes, where everything we have is common and shared. No, these were not communists, they were hippies. But since they were only young people, big auto companies didn't target this group. They had less money, so why pay attention to them? This mass culture was treated like it was just a current fashion that would vanish away in a year or two. But let's leave hippies for a second. The oldest American car company, Packard, aka American Rolls-Royce, that was in business since 1899, suddenly got closed in 1956. Packard was a luxury brand, and it didn't do well during the Great Depression. There was no demand for expensive cars. While the big three could offer relatively cheap cars to a consumer, Packard couldn't. So Packard decided to start making budget cars as well, to stay above the water like the big three companies. But due to its lack of experience producing such cars, it was barely breaking even for 20 years. Plus, Packard's original audience was losing interest in the brand because wealthy clients didn't like the idea of brand diversification with cheap cars. Clearly poor management and marketing, but Packard was the important bell that something else was wrong that the big three companies did not see. Of course, luxury car brands could suffer during the depression, but it would come back to life during the 1950s when everyone had money. But it didn't. If the big three companies were able to co-op with the UAW union, small Packard didn't have such money and was going bankrupt because of the strikes at its factories. To avoid bankruptcy, Packard decided to buy Studebaker, which by that point was already making cheap cars. So technically, if they get together, they could be a fourth big company. But Studebaker management hid all its debt and falsified earnings reports. So instead, Packard purchased a lemon no-profit company and in 1956 went out of business forever. The overproduction crisis in the US and the international trade crisis worldwide both happened in 1957. And where there's a crisis, there are layoffs. And the biggest were at the Detroit factories. Some people went homeless, some left the city. Social problems started to be a real issue. There were always controversies between the rich and poor, but now the black and white problem had become more serious as there was still strong discrimination against black people in the 1960s. Martin Luther King gave his famous speech diffusing the situation a bit in 1963, therefore starting a movement for the rights of black people. Because of the ongoing crisis, factories tried to optimize losses by firing more people and strikes became an ordinary thing. So the government placed Detroit under curfew to keep workers out of the streets. However, there was one night that heavily worsened the situation. One bar, which was illegally operated during curfew, was raided by police, starting massive brawling at the spot. The next day, on July 23, 1967, crowds of people oppressed by injustice went on the streets and began civil unrest, smashing shop windows, setting cars on fire, and robbing businesses. It was the first and only time in U.S. history when the government had to use the military to suppress the riot as over 10,000 people participated in it, causing massive destruction. All of this chaos created a second wave of migration, forcing a skilled and educated population to leave Detroit. The city's economy was getting worse, and the big three companies wanted to reorganize the factories due to the changing environment. But unions were blocking every good solution. Union representatives neither knew how to do business, nor did they understand that big business made everything possible for Detroit. Creating jobs, attracting skilled and non-skilled labor in the area, and growing it into an industrial center. They were not business managers, but politicians, missing the fact that while the big three companies were getting weaker, there were foreign brands that started taking over the automotive market. And here's why. Our underestimated hippie population had already grown up into a young core middle-class people who could afford cars, but their values remained as they were before. All American car manufacturers could offer was big gas-guzzling boats with extra soft leather on board, but people didn't want that. The first big offender was the Volkswagen Beetle or Bug, which wasn't quite successful in the 1950s because Americans still remembered what Hitler's car was and didn't want to buy it. But by the 1960s, due to proper marketing and characteristics, the Bug started getting the respect of the consumers. And it was more reliable and wasn't depreciating two times as American cars did after a year of use. The continuing decline of sales forced Chevrolet to quickly come up with Chevy Corvair, 
a very immature, under-engineered car that was rolling over during tests that was somehow still launched on the market. While American car manufacturers were studying their new target customer, the bug became extra successful, jumping from 100,000 cars sold annually at the beginning of the 1960s to 550,000 cars by the end of the decade. Meanwhile, Japanese car brands were studying American car owners from the 1950s, and by 1964, Toyota understood how to attract an average American customer by making a relatively comfortable, nice-looking car equipped with AC. But the main advertised point was a running test where Toyota Corona drove down the highway for 60,000 miles, or 100,000 kilometers, without a single breakdown, which was out of mind for a cheap automatic car at the time. Honda, on the other hand, became popular because of its little, technologically advanced, fuel-efficient engines, which showed American car brands how obsolete and practically incapable of competing they were. The last nail in the coffin of the American car manufacturers was the oil crisis of the 1970s, when oil-rich Arabian countries refused to sell oil to the U.S. This further pushed the general public to use smaller, efficient European and Japanese cars. This time, the UAW union decided to save everyone by incorporating a tremendously stupid strategy to fight Japanese car makers. The union was placing a Japanese Toyota at every county fair or other public event like it and were giving people a huge hammer to crush the car for fun. A very unique and sophisticated American way of having fun back in the 1970s that was supposed to support domestic car sales. Meanwhile, fired American factory workers were told that this was not because of poor management, but because of aggressive Japanese car brands that were ruining the US economy. Another brilliant decision was to give the remaining factory workers encouraging bumper stickers saying, Nissan Toyota Pearl Harbor. It almost became unethical to own a Japanese car during those years. Finally, in 1981, the US government decided to implement a protective policy to support domestic car makers by putting a limitation on importing cars in the US at 1,680,000 cars a year. However, the United States still was a capitalistic country, so Honda just built their own factory in Ohio in 1983. And the best thing here is that Honda didn't have a UAW union within their factory, and they didn't need one because they had a completely different philosophy and approach to the production. In 1984, Toyota and GM teamed up to manufacture vehicles to be sold under both brands at an old GM plant in California. By 1990, the best-selling car in the US was the Honda Accord, and Detroit was lost as a city and an industrial center. It fell into oblivion and became a high crime area with rising debt over the years. What was really the reason for the end of the American automotive empire? Racial or union problems? Poor management and marketing decisions? Government mistakes? It's all of that together. But I believe that the main thing was while being rich and prosperous from the 1940s to 1960s, American car makers didn't see the changing world around them. European and Japanese car brands knew that it was a customer who brings them money, and they studied their customer well. So it doesn't matter who was defeated in World War II yesterday, when today they built a brand on the new market, from scratch, beating American capitalism at its own game. Isn't that a good life and business lesson? Let me know in the comments, and if you like this video, then you need to watch these ones.